I'm from the First Nations from Canada. On the rest, traditional beliefs and legends of the paranormal are still a big part of our community. The paranormal is part of life. We know there's a spirit world, and we know that sometimes these things can come over to our side and maybe even live among us. Anyways, here's the story. It was around the fall of 2011. I was 16 years old and I was living in the city near the rest with my mom. Every weekend, we would go back home to the rest to see my dad and my little brother. On Friday, during the drive back home, I got a text from a friend of mine. There was a party that night and she wanted to know when I would be home so that she could come pick me up. I gave her a time and she told me she would swing by. My mom and I get home and as soon as we step inside the house, we see my dad and my cousin sitting at the kitchen table, drinking some beers. They're actually both cops on the res, and beers on a Friday evening means that they had a tough week at work. Normally, the toughest cases to deal with are child abuse, and sometimes other darker things, so a part of me feels sad upon seeing them. They both look very tired and drained, but they're happy to see us. We say our greetings, catch up a little, and my dad then starts asking me if I have any plans. I mention the party, and I tell him where it's gonna be. He and my cousin share a weird look. He says, I don't know if we should say it, while looking at my dad. He laughed, and they decided that I should most likely know what's been going on, since I'll be going to a house that's pretty deep in the woods later that evening. They start with the first strange call that they got on Monday night. An older woman called saying that there were people outside of her house, knocking on all of her windows. But she said that she couldn't see anybody, but there must have been at least three people judging by all the different locations of the knocking. They arrive at the woman's home, inspect all around the house, and even check the woods, but nothing comes up. They tell her that's most likely just some teenagers playing tricks on her and that there isn't much else they can do besides patrol around the area in case they come back. On Wednesday night, the same woman calls again with the same issue. She said people were knocking on all her windows again. It had rained that day and there was mud and dirt all around this woman's home. So they figure at the very least they'll find footprints, but they couldn't find anything. This is when I started feeling like something was very off because there were huge patches of mud everywhere. They thought maybe the woman was just lying for attention, but they told her the same thing they told her a few nights ago. By Thursday night, even though everyone on the rest was talking, it turns out that this woman wasn't the only one experiencing the knocking. She was just the only one to call the police. People were linking it to supernatural causes, but my dad was still sure it was just a group of teens pranking people. But then they got another call from the same woman for the same reason. They rushed over there and were met with the same situation. Except this time, the woman's neighbor walked over looking pale as a ghost. He said, is this about the knocking? He was looking very shaky. And they said, did you see something? He nodded and said, you guys are going to think that I'm crazy. He goes on to explain that he just stepped outside for a cigarette on his front porch when he heard the knocking. He looked around and saw something by the old woman's house. There was a black figure standing outside her window, looking inside of her home. He said it looked like a person, but completely made out of shadow. And he could tell it was solid, but there were no features on it. He stared at it completely in shock and watched as the thing knocked a couple of times and then darted around the house, knocking on every single window. He said it moved too fast to be a human. He said it went around the house a few times. Then it ran across the road into the tree line, specifically behind one tree, as though it was hiding. The man was frozen, but he couldn't look away. The black shadow then leaned out from behind a tree, and now stared directly at him, with yellow eyes that reflect the light like those of a cat, and then it smiled, showing small pointed teeth. The guy then said, fucking shit in my pants. He tried a joke, 
but his voice was very much still in shock. My dad didn't know what to make of this, but after checking the old woman and finding her alright, even though she was shaken, he told them they would keep an eye on things and just to put it out of their minds, try not to think about it. So jumping ahead till Friday, by this point, everyone's got their own story. In addition to numerous people experiencing the same knocking, there were also quite a few more sightings and everyone described the thing exactly the same way. To my dad, one woman was taking her trash bin to the road when she thought she saw someone from the corner of her eye standing near the trees. As she walked back up the driveway to her home, she felt like somebody was watching her. Right before she was about to open the door to go back inside, she looked back and saw the two reflective yellow eyes watching her from the trees. She then said that they were about five feet off the ground. Another couple was driving at night and they saw a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. As they got closer, they slowed down and it turned around to face them. They saw the figure had the same reflective yellow eyes and the sharp pointed teeth as it smiled at them. They stopped the car, too afraid to get any closer to it until they decided they should just speed past it. The road was very narrow and the figure was only a few feet away as they drove by it. They said it was maintaining eye contact with them the whole time. My father then asked me if I was still planning on going. What a coincidence. My friends were already pulling into the driveway just as he had finished. So I gave my family hugs and kisses and said goodbye. They told me to be careful, but I wasn't too concerned. Even though a common belief among us native people is that negative energy attracts negative energy. So an evil spirit will be drawn to people with unresolved issues. But if you're someone who is spiritual, self-aware, and basically a good person, that itself can protect you. So I get to the party, and within 20 minutes, the conversation started about all the paranormal experiences that people have been having. I'm really curious about what everyone has to say, because they all have stories that I haven't heard yet. But my friend couldn't hold her alcohol very well. We were 16, after all, and she was crying. And I was trying to make her feel better while listening to everyone's stories. One of the people at the party was related to the smoking man that my father first talked about. The one who first described the shadow thing that darted into the trees. This person told us that the experience shook the smoking man up so much that he had to get his entire home smudged. Smudging is something our people do when we're looking for extra protection against the paranormal. This man also went to visit a few elders around the community, asking for advice, or if they knew what the hell was going on. It's commonly said on the res that paranormal experiences don't happen as often as they used to. If you talk to the elders, they have endless stories, and even more advice about how to protect yourself compared to younger generations. Anyways, the man had gone to visit some of the elders, and one of them had explained that the shadow thing that everyone was seeing was evidence that somebody had done a forbidden shaking tent ceremony. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up more in detail. But it's basically, and I'm going to generalize here, sort of like a Ouija board session, but it takes place inside of a tent. People stand around the tent while the medicine man goes inside and starts to ask questions. The tent begins to shake and you can hear the voices of spirits coming through. I have never personally been to a shaking tent ceremony because we haven't had a good enough reason to make one. Our ancestors used them when they were starving and in the dead of winter and needed to know where the nearest food source was. My mom's been to one and her stories are crazy. She described multiple voices, men and women, all speaking the native tongue. She said they were very upset that the people were doing a shaking tent ceremony since they weren't yet on the verge of death. The people tried to explain that they were only doing the ceremony to prove that it was real. 
This was at a time when people felt like we were losing our culture as a result of the residential schools, but the explanations didn't help. The spirits were angry about this, saying that the bridge between the two worlds should never be opened unless absolutely necessary because you don't know who you're communicating with. It could be good spirits, but it could also be evil. It might be ancestors, but you just never know. Anyways, back to the smoking man. The elders told him that the shadow thing with yellow eyes that everyone was hearing and seeing was the spirit. It crossed over into our side because of a shaking tent ceremony. Someone on the res had been doing them without the consultation of the elders. At this point, two of the most drunk dudes at the party started saying disrespectful things about this shadow person trying to act all tough. Most of us were looking at each other like, why would you disrespect an evil spirit? That's exactly how you attract them to you. That's when I went back to console my drunk crying friend. As I was with her, I noticed that the rocking chair outside on the porch was rocking back and forth by itself. I quickly looked away, refusing to make direct eye contact, but I could still see it from the corner of my eye. We are raised in our culture to ignore certain events. Spirits feed on the energy that people put towards them. So if you freak out, get angry, yell at it, scream at it, start crying, or anything like that, it'll actually stick around. That's what it wants. It thrives on energy of any kind. Five minutes or so go by, and I'm still seeing the rocking chair move out of the corner of my eye. Suddenly, I hear a commotion. One of the other girls claims to have seen the spirit. We named it Kukai. It's a word. An Algonquin translating to monster. She said she was listening to the boys talk about the spirit when she saw one of the boys staring very strange out into the balcony behind her. She turned around to see what he was looking at and through the window was the shadow spirit sitting on the rocking chair. Literally three feet away from her, smiling. The boy who had been staring out there sprinted towards the balcony doors, slammed them open, and charged at the spirit. I went outside to check on this boy. He turned back to look at me and said, get everyone inside right now. The tone of his voice made me just listen. He got back inside and told everyone to clean up the place so that we could leave. We spent a while just cleaning. That's when we began to hear the knocking coming from all around the house. After a while, we were finally ready to leave. People ran out, pile into their cars, and began to take off. Me and the boy were walking towards his truck. He was actually my ride home. When suddenly, he began to rush me and push me into the truck. Then he jumped in and we just peeled out. I asked him why he did that, but he refused to talk about it. A few days later, I ended up hanging out with him again, and he told me his experience of that night. When the other boys were disrespecting the spirit, he said he saw it appear out of thin air, onto the rocking chair, out on the balcony. He made eye contact with it, and suddenly, couldn't look away. He and the spirit were staring each other down, and that's when one of the girls saw his expression. She turned around, saw the spirit, and screamed. He said his first instinct was to defend his friends, and that's why he ran outside. He said the feeling that he was getting from the kukai was almost like it was daring him to do something. But the second he got up, the thing stood up and ran into the woods, disappearing from the patio. When the boy went outside, he stood on the lawn and saw it standing at the tree line, looking right at him with a smile on its face. Later, as we walked back to the truck, he saw it again closer, and that's why he pushed me into his truck to leave. After he dropped us off at our houses, he and his friends realized that they never locked the door to the cabin, so they went back. But his friend was too scared to go in, even though it belonged to him, so the boy went in by himself. The second he opened the door, the thing, was standing in the living room. The boy locked the door as fast as he could, 
and hopped back in the truck. The two then peeled out of the driveway. The sightings continued for a few days after that. It was the talk of the res. But then suddenly, everything just stopped. There was no more knocking, no more sightings. Everyone was curious about what happened to the spirit. What was it? And could it come back? Would it come back? Eventually, word came from up north where sightings of the same spirit were seen in a different community. And then some of the white people in the town, just north of us, started to report very similar strange events. And then other reservations near us were as well. The way the stories were coming in, it's like the spirit was traveling north. As of 2018, there's been no more sightings. No one on my res or anybody else has seen anything remotely similar to what was going on. So, what do you all think? Let me know. Several years ago, I was studying business at a public college and I hated my life. And this was in the early 2010s, by the way. I was depressed. I had no friends. I had nobody. And this was a party school, so you could easily make friends everywhere. I was even close to dropping some classes. I had no job, no prospects of any. All I already had to my name was mostly negative. And during this stage of my life, when I felt that things couldn't get any worse, and I felt that I was at the bottom of the barrel, rock bottom, I ended up losing my last close relative to a car accident. I decided at that point that I had about enough of this shit. I grabbed my gun, a couple of boxes of ammo, some winter clothes, camping supplies, and three days worth of food. My plan was to wander off into the St. Joseph National Forest to die. And no, I didn't take a camera with me because I felt that it would just go to waste. After all, I was there to die. It was mid-December. It was very snowy outside. I stopped at Walmart to buy another box of ammo and a few packs of Newport cigarettes. I went to the bathroom there and I saw this poster near the toilet. There was this cute girl that had recently gone missing and I stared at her picture for a while, almost burning it into my memory. I end up leaving Walmart still thinking about this girl and the thoughts were of how I'll never have one of my own and how I'll never have a family and all that stuff. So I drove out to Idaho and I ended up arriving at my destination. I step out of the car into the cold. I still remember the feeling that it gave me. The crunch of the snow underneath my cheap boots. I unpacked my stuff. I ditched the car and I left it unlocked. I started walking. I light up a cigarette and I eventually lose sight of my car. So I hiked for a couple of hours. And after a while, I started to realize that I was just going in circles. So I veered off the trail and I just started hiking through the woods. I was really drinking in the beauty of it all. It's such a haunting and desolated place in the winter time. I started running low on cigarettes and I started to get the feeling that I shouldn't be where I am. Just a little bit of fear, but I ignored it as I was out there to die anyhow. I then began to feel like I'm being followed. I hear branches break behind me every so often, but I assume it's just snowfall weighing down on the branches until they drop. That's what it could have been, but I still doubt it. I run out of cigarettes shortly before sundown and I say, oh fuck, almost in a loud voice. And I almost felt guilty for breaking the silence. That sort of feeling that you get if you said like a bunch of cuss words in front of your grandma at church. So I set up this empty water bottle. I fire some rounds at it from 50 yards with the motion. And the echoes just rang. And I didn't bring any hearing protection. Because you know, I was on a suicide trip. I pulled out a single round and I tucked it into my boot. And I'm thinking that I'm going to use this one for shooting myself later on. I took the backpack off to do the shooting, 
And when I went to grab it, I noticed movement in the trees, maybe just a hundred yards away. And I noticed it because it was big. Whatever it was, it was really fucking big. I never had good eyesight. That's why the Navy wouldn't take me. So I figured in the moment that it was just a blurry elk. I was standing there staring at it, wondering if there are even any elk in this part of the world. I then started to get this funny feeling. Moving slowly, I went to chamber around in my gun. It got stuck for some reason, and I glanced to see what the problem was. And when I looked up, it was gone. It was almost like it was a ghost. Well, the worst they can do is kill me, right? I mean, that's what I'm here for. So I blow off the whole experience and I quickly forget about it while making my camp. I'm trying to get a fire set up and trying to find wood is extremely difficult and it's being a real pain in the ass. So I get frustrated and I have my little hissy fit and I throw a piece of wood at a fucking tree. After yelling at myself and screaming, fuck, fuck. you, at the trees, I calm down and I start to make camp. I then stop to eat because I'm not gonna die of starvation out here and I'm eating my MRE and I'm starting to think, wait a second, why does this taste like blood? And then I realize that the air smells like blood. And I think what the hell is going on here? It's the winter. And then I remember, I read about this before. But I tell myself to relax. There's nothing. And then I hear a distorted, fuck, fuck you, coming from the trees. It sounded like somebody was talking through an AM radio. I leap to my feet with my gun in my hand. I'm spinning around and around scanning the trees for any sign of movement. I then hear a branch break at my 9 o'clock, so I spin around and hold my rifle still. There's a fine dusting of snow that starts to collect on my rifle. After about an hour, I finally relax and I go into my sleeping bag. And I don't have a tent. Not because I'm out here to kill myself, but because I actually forgot one. And at that point I think, wow, I really am an idiot. So I fold the sleeping bag over myself without sipping it and I sleep with my rifle in my hands ready to go. I fall asleep with almost my entire body stuffed into the sleeping bag, but something woke me up. It was that smell again. It's the same as before, but much stronger. I then noticed that my fire was out. I checked my watch and I realized I had slept maybe two hours or so. I then realized that there's a tree that shouldn't be there, right at the foot of my sleeping bag. It's not a tree. It starts to move a little. I swear, I can almost hear it take a breath. It's much taller than a person for sure, and thicker too. I was able to make out the arms, long, with these weird claw-looking things on the end of them. The arms were hanging loose by its sides. My heart starts to pound out of my chest, until that's all I can hear. For a split second, I consider putting the barrel into my mouth and trying to end it all before whatever this is gets me. But the adrenaline takes over. I slept with my gun in my hands ready to go in case something like this did happen. I used the gun to flip the sleeping bag off of me. I aim at the figure and I fire around. And I'm blinded and become deaf because of the noise. I leap to my feet swinging the rifle in front of me like a club and screaming. I slowly regain my vision and I panic. I scan the tree lines. It's gone. Maybe it's hiding behind a tree. I then start to think, wow, I haven't yeah, felt a fear like this in my whole life. And then I get loud. I'll kill you. Fuck off. And then somebody replies, a distant but clear, hello, followed by a second later, hey, are you okay? I reply with, who the hell are you? What do you want? The message came back. My name is Jim. Are you alright? I ended up talking with it some more, all the while nervously scanning the perimeter. Then, a couple of other voices chimed in from the same direction, and I told them that I almost got attacked by a bear. They fire off an orange flare, and I realized that they were actually a lot closer to me than I thought they were. They were just down over a hill. I'm pretty sure I passed through the clearing that they set up shortly before I made camp. Hey man, can you come to us? What if I get ambushed? I say. 
Fine, I'll come to you. I have a gun. But don't shoot me, okay? It seems like it took homie forever to show up. We played a game of Marco Polo until he got to me. He had a stainless steel 357 and a flashlight. He introduced himself as Jim. He was a nice guy. He asked me if I was injured, and he was also short. I don't know why, but I figured he would be tall. He led me back to his camp and spoke to me quietly on the way. We had bear troubles as well. And then he got even more quiet and said, But this ain't no fucking bear. You agree? And I replied, Couldn't agree more. After walking a little bit, he then says, The others still think that we just ran into a bear in the woods. And they're all pretty calm, so try not to scare them. We were having a party out here and half of them are shit-faced. I simply nod and say, Roger, how many people do you have with you? And he says, There's six others. We arrived at the camp. There were coolers and a couple of tents scattered around a low fire. There were beer cans everywhere, trash everywhere, and a moment of humor to break all the tension. Some insanely drunk dude stumbles up to me, puts his hand on my shoulders, and says, Where is the bathroom, man? And I just think to myself, that this is a shitty horror movie and we're all gonna die and no one's ever gonna find us. The only other gun besides mine and Jim's 357 is a 22, unless you count the flare gun as well. Jim and the kid with the 22, who ended up introducing himself as Travis, were trying to convince the other friends to stop drinking in case the bear comes back. Jim then introduces me to everybody. The drunk guy from earlier has stumbled into a tent, and he is passed out. As well as this other girl, that's in a different tent as well. I shake hands and exchange names with everyone else. But something is off. I notice it right away. I'm looking around at everybody, and I start to run some numbers in my head. There's seven people in total, two asleep in the tent. Why are there still six people out here? Jim then goes off to work on the fire, and I go to say hello to the last person, some other girl. She just ignores this and stares at me. It's kind of dark, but I swear that her face looks familiar. I then see something move from the corner of my eye. It's stainless steel. It's the barrel of Jim's gun. He's pointing it at the person that I'm trying to talk to. Slowly moving closer, her face hasn't changed. It's totally blank. I get the feeling that I know her, and that's when I realize that I do. Her face matches the one of the missing person poster at Walmart. Homie then starts to say something to the effect of who the fuck are you? And then she wheels around and just goes into a dead sprint into the tree line. In an instant, so fucking fast, people who saw it start yelling. Who the fuck was that? What the hell? And then the smell of blood comes back. I check my gun. It's loaded. We then form a perimeter around the campsite. Over time, we make these expeditions to go to the tree line, panicking and gathering as much wood as we can to build a fire as big as we can. Everyone who isn't drunk is clutching something. The 22, the flare gun, machetes, a hatchet, even regular knives. Nobody says a word. We then hear branches breaking off in one direction, and then more breaking in the same direction and the smell starts to get stronger and I'm starting to think fuck I wish I had my cigarettes right now the girl with the flare gun sees something and fires a flare into the trees underneath my breath I think oh great you wasted one I then see the silhouette 15 or so feet from where the flare was lighting everything up I fire around at it it hits a tree and the thing just bolts away People see it and hear it run to the trees, but it doesn't run from the campsite. We can hear where it just stays around. Branches break, and people see things move around for another hour or so. At some point, the kid with the 22 starts to fire off rounds at almost everything. He then gets screamed at for wasting ammo. This continues. Jim grabs him and shakes him and tells him to knock it off. And I realize now that they look so much alike because they're brothers. As the whole thing unfolds, I start to hear something loud behind me. I look around and fire a shot at the blur that's moving towards the camp. 
This thing then sprints right through the camp. It grabs the dude and tries to haul him off into the woods. The guy had a machete and started hacking at it, and it let him go. He was curled in a ball screaming. We dragged him back to the fire and calmed him down. But the thing was big. I saw it run with a funny gait, but it was fast. Oversized feet, and it even had antlers. I swear it had some. Someone then says, Oh fuck, Jimmy, are you okay? This thing then starts to circle more. All of us, myself included, started panic shooting into the trees. We're all running low on ammo, and it's only 3 a.m. The fire is burning low. Then, it starts talking to us, mocking us, saying stuff that we already said. A couple of people started crying. I started to fucking lose it myself. The sting charges again right at me. I scream at it. My rifle had a bayonet, and I buried it into its body and pulled the trigger. It tries to swipe at me with a claw, and it just goes over my head. It then pulls back and darts back into the tree line. I chased after it, gun raced over my head, screaming. I get into the trees and saw it crouching there six feet from me. It was dark, but I saw it. I looked into its eyes and just lost it. Every bit of courage left me. I stood there stiff, waiting for it to just kill me. I felt like hopeless prey. A couple of people grabbed me by the shoulders and dragged me back to the fire. I know they didn't even see it, but it was right there. I only have three rounds left now. I used the snow to clean the black, steaming blood off my bayonet. The camp was still circled, but we seemed to have injured the thing, and it wasn't saying or peering at us anymore. It was just wheezing, this loud, terrible, awful wheezing sound, with what sounded like a cough, and a shriek as well. The sun finally came up. It was the most beautiful sunrise I had ever seen, I swear. Everybody packed up their stuff. We hiked about 10 or so tense minutes in a tight formation to a trail very close by. I had no idea that it was there. I followed the trail back to their pathfinder, and they all jumped in, and I'm stuck, just standing there. I start to remember my mission, why it was that I came there. I looked down at my rifle. I still had three rounds. I remember the bullet in my shoe. Four rounds left. And someone says, What the, what the fuck, fuck are you doing standing there? there? Get the, the fuck, fuck in the car. car. I stop and say, Uh, sorry. I have unfinished business. And I start to walk back down the trail. Back into the woods. I feel the crunch of snow beneath my boots. The ray of sunlight shining down. Then, suddenly, I felt somebody hit me in my head, and I blacked out. They ended up hauling ass out of there, and they swear they saw something big step out from behind a tree, and watched them take me and drive away. We all agree that we shouldn't go back there again. A lot of them didn't even want to talk about it for some reason. I never did actually go back for my car. It was a piece of shit anyways. So... Yeah, that's the time that I was almost going to kill myself. But I guess somebody, or something out there, had other ideas. Life is a journey filled with peaks and valleys, highs and lows. Some struggles we wear them on public. Or if you're like me, we sometimes hide them beneath our smiles. I know I've done that plenty of times through difficult seasons and we all face pressure differently. I know that we all have battles that we're fighting, demons that we might be wrestling with, but we don't gotta face them alone. Sometimes, all it takes is reaching out, talking to those around us. This isn't part of the story, but to anyone who's out there listening, who might be standing on the edge, going through a difficult season, maybe, even thinking of a choice that they think they can't come back from. I want you to know this. You're not alone. There is hope. Just reach out. Drop a comment. Send me an email. Call a family member. Call a friend. And maybe just say, 
I need you to listen. Say what you need to say. Get it off your chest. Sometimes all we need is a listening ear. Mental struggles, anxiety, depression. It's a real thing. Something that really helped me within the last two years of losing my father-in-law and my own father as well and two miscarriages is when somebody told me look at your hands and when you're struggling just tell yourself I can only control what is in front of me today I had my darkest season ever last year full of depression and being anxious and something that really helped me was simply talking with you all Francisco and I have been married for only three years when this happened. We lived in Texas at that time, and we actually still do. We hadn't seen his parents who live in a small pueblo in Mexico since we got married. That's why we wanted to take advantage of spring break to visit them. My name is Viviana, and this happened 10 years ago. Our two older children who joined us at that time were just young kids. We rested in different cities along the way as we got closer. We still had a little bit more to go to reach the village, but we were all getting tired. And, well, if you have kids, then you know how this goes being in a car stuck with them for more than a few hours. We did end up stopping halfway, and when I woke up that morning, my husband received a call from his family. He didn't want to tell me what the conversation was about, but I saw his expression change from joy to concern. I brushed it off, but looking back, I should have known that something was going on or something was gonna happen. As we got closer, I noticed that my husband somehow was starting to get a bit nervous. I asked him if he was all right because he didn't seem excited like he had been previously. He simply said that he was tired and he was ready to get there as we were only about 30 minutes away. However, the situation changed when we saw that the road was blocked. He parked the car. He was deep in thought for a few moments and then suggested that we go back to a hotel until the road was clear. Now this was very strange. We were almost there. A few extra minutes wouldn't hurt nobody, but it was obvious that he didn't want to take a detour which was a dirt filled road that would take us more time to reach his village. Now, in some remote places in Mexico, or getting close to the ranchos, there are no street lights, making it impossible to see beyond the reach of the car headlights. If something happened to you, or if your car stopped, you would be stranded in these roads unless someone found you. I then looked at my husband and told him that it would be fine. The kids are asleep, and some few extra minutes won't be so bad. Plus, the sun still hasn't fully set, and we can possibly make it before nighttime. He then started the car and whispered, You know what? You're right. Que Dios nos ayude. God will help us. And we venture into the road. The road was lonely and surrounded by woods as well. After about 30 minutes or so, I noticed that he started speeding and going faster. I asked him if he could slow down, that it was important that we arrive safe. But I know why he was speeding. The sun was beginning to descend and it was getting dark. He was saying that we had to get to his parents' house soon before they come out. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with some of the stories from Mexico about brujos, nahuales, Duendes, the Santa Muerte, the Holy Death, and people who can shapeshift into animals. Basically witchcraft. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. There is a lot of that going on down here. My husband was one of those superstitious type, and so he always talked about certain things about Mexico. Like, don't speak about these things. Don't go out at night, especially out here in the ranchos. He always had stories about stuff happening to him as a kid. About birds turning into witches and flying away. Noises being heard at night. 
and people cursing animals and livestock and even humans themselves. Another 30 minutes or so passed and I chose not to say anything no more as I saw my husband focused on the road. And then there's the loud noise that comes from the front of the bumper. I only remember seeing something crossing out of nowhere when it happened. It was so fast. I screamed and the children started crying. Francisco stopped the car and got out to see what we had hit. I still had the children hug when he returned and he quickly started the car. He had a horrified look on his face that I had never seen before. Whatever he saw scared him. I asked him what was happening and all he said was that it was an animal and we needed to get out of there quickly. A few minutes passed and that's when I began to hear loud shrieks in the darkness getting closer and closer to us. Then, I started to hear those screams alongside of us. It also sounded like something was running beside the car. I turned to look, and that's when I saw it. It was a huge animal, similar to a black bull, but its size was abnormal. It had horns, and it had large red eyes. It was looking at us as it was running beside us. I could see saliva coming from its mouth with every scream it let out. I know this wasn't a normal animal. Its distorted face and features. It looked almost like a demon. Our kids started screaming. I covered their eyes to try to protect them, but those sounds made all of us tremble in fear. Francisco began to shout some words towards it, and he told me to move away from the window. That's when this thing, or this demon, or whatever the fuck it was, started hitting the car with its body. I felt like my heart wanted to jump out of my chest with every hit. I think it was on the fourth or fifth blow when Francisco lost control of the car and we ended up on the side of the woods, stopping right next to a tree. The impact was so hard that all I remember is seeing my husband passed out on the steering wheel. That's when I felt blood starting to trickle down my forehead and still dazed. I managed to see towards the window and I saw those demonic red eyes staring at us through the window. It was doing this while fogging up the glass and it looked like it had a smirk on its face. That's the only thing I remember of that night. That's when I passed out and that's all I remember. Sometime later I woke up I was lying on the side of the vehicle and there were several people helping my husband and children. A woman approached me and she started cleaning the cut on my forehead. Then I recognized them as my in-laws and my brothers-in-law as well. The morning found us in a small medical room. Lucky for all of us, we were all fine, just a few bruises. But that night, back at my in-law's house, they revealed to us that this creature that had attacked us was a Nagual that was actually known in the town. What we hit with the car moments before the crash was a different Nagual and apparently it was the young son of the first one. Francisco then said that when he got out of the car, this Dean was lying on the ground and couldn't move. The Nagual that was trying to kill us was near the young one at the time of the crash and upon seeing him injured on the ground he followed us as revenge. The call my husband received that morning was from his relatives back home and it was about the road being blocked and to warn him that the detour road that we were gonna take was full of brujos or witches. After spending the week with my husband's relatives we returned back to Texas. It was the most terrifying experience we had to live through. Even though the last memory we had was disturbing. Before leaving the town, I felt a chill run through my body again. At a distance, in front of us, I could see an old man walking alongside his young son, who had a broken leg. When they fixed their gaze on us, my blood froze 
as I remember the same feeling I had that night when that demon, brujo, nagual, or whatever the fuck it was, looked at me with those unforgettable, sinister, red eyes. So if you ever go down to Mexico, my advice to you would be for you to stay in the city, take only the main roads, and if you're going to visit family or friends in a rancho, in a village, don't go through any back roads. You never know who or what you might come across. For years, I was the guy you would call if you had a squirrel in your attic. I mean, to a lot of people, I'm still that guy. But over the last 20 years, I have branched out to other less common infestations. Now, I'm the guy you call if there is a haunted doll going through your attic or a Sasquatch trampling your flower beds. I actually love my job. All the skills I have acquired have allowed me to travel across the country. I have met incredible people and I have experienced cryptids like few have ever done before. It doesn't hurt that the pay is great, but the stories are even better. I have one short story for you now. It's more of a public service announcement than anything else really. I have dealt with every sort of infestation from Sasquatches. You spray human urine around the area of siding and it will avoid the area. A demonic presence, you need to bring in a priest. Sometimes it can be tricked into inhabiting a lesser creature, like a frog. And jackalopes, it's just a bunny with some antlers. Put it in a cage and give the poor thing a carrot. But recently, there has been one cryptid that has been growing more and more invasive into human settlements. It's called the hide behind. Most commonly found in the forest of the North United States and Canada, the hide behind is one cryptid that cannot easily be dealt with. In fact, I'm not sure it's even possible for one of these to be bagged and tagged like we normally would with other creatures. To my knowledge, no hide behind has ever been killed, maimed, dazed, or even simply removed from a residence. Once it has made a claim to an area, whether it be a local forest, a cave, or even, in one specific bloody case, a bass pro shop, it will actually defend that area to the death. It was first documented by the Native Americans, then by the lumberjacks in the PNW of America, the hide behind is one of the lesser known but cryptids on the continent, but without a doubt, one of the most dangerous. No one really knows what they actually look like. As the name suggests, as soon as they are seen, they quickly duck out of view to hide behind anything in the vicinity. Out in the wild, this would be trees and rocks. In your home, this could be a corner, a kitchen cabinet, a TV, or literally anything else they can manipulate their body to hide behind an object of any size. In the few accounts of the sightings we have on record, they have been described as everything from a large bear, lion hybrid, to a frail and elderly woman with long arms and rashes on her skin. Because of this wide discrepancy in their descriptions, they are believed to be shapeshifters that can change their shape based on what they believe will best get their potential victim to come closer and investigate the sighting. I don't know why the hide behinds are moving into suburbs. I guess destruction of their natural habitat, but it is becoming a real problem. That's why I'm going to share the story with you now, so you know what to do if one ever shows up in your home. 
I pulled up to Tim's house around 12 p.m. on a Tuesday. He had called in to tell us there was a demonic entity in his house. He wanted us to remove it ASAP. They always demand ASAP. Tim had nothing going on, but people are just so much more demanding now than they were 20 years ago. I took a quick look around the house and it was pretty apparent there wasn't any sort of demon in his residence. Not only was there no reaction to the holy water and Ouija board I had brought with me, but Tim also didn't have normal symptoms of a demon haunting him. Bad dreams, sleep paralysis, or the witnessing of any telekinetic events. After further questioning, he described what he had seen in more detail. He said, First, I was sitting right there on the couch watching TV when I got the feeling I was being watched. I turned my attention to the screen door and for just a second, I saw a bear looking in through the screen. But it wasn't a bear, you see. A bear would have just kept on staring at me or keep poking at the door. But this thing just ducked out of view as quick as can be. Like it was trying to sneak up on me and I had caught it in the act, but I just grabbed my gun, set it on my lap, and kept on watching the TV, and eventually that feeling, like I was being watched, just kinda melted off. It was all peaches and cream until she showed up a few days later. This she that Tim was referring to was a new human form that the hide behind was taking. I assume it was because of the lack of a reaction to the bear form it had previously shown itself as. Like I said earlier, the hide behind wants you to look for it, to come near. Like the angler fish, it dangles something in front of you, attempting to bring you closer. It's a lazy hunter. Tim then continued, I was out in the garage in my workshop and that feeling came over me again, that being watched feeling. I turn around and I'm looking out the garage door, but I don't see anything. But then out of nowhere, I see a lady's head and shoulder pop out from the corner of the garage. And the second that she sees me looking at her, she pops right back around the corner where she came from. Well, this time, I went looking around for her, so I had seen crazy people, and she looked crazy, and I didn't want her grabbing me, so I gave a wide berth around that corner, and there was no one there. I walked all around the house, and I didn't see anyone, not even footprints. Tell me that's not demonic. It wasn't demonic. It was a hide behind. And I told the man as such. I told him living out here on the edge of town made him an easy target for it. I told him that there really isn't any way to get rid of them or scare them off. I told him he could try to leave his house for a year at minimum. And maybe, with luck, it will leave on its own. But the best bet would be for him to burn the place down and never come back. He didn't like that answer. My family lived in this house for three generations. I'm not leaving. And I sure as hell ain't burning nothing down. I'll tell you what though. I'm gonna keep my shotgun on me. And when I get that feeling again, I'm gonna shoot it. It works for bears. And that's the meanest thing around these parts. I don't see why it wouldn't work for this. What you call it? Hide behind? You can't argue with anyone over the age of 65. People get set in their ways. Their beliefs calcify. So instead, I was honest with him. I told him two things. The first thing I told him was that eventually, he'll get that feeling that he was being watched. And he'll get his gun, and he'll start looking around for the hide behind. Only he wouldn't find it. That's what happens in all these cases. Because at that point, it found the best hiding spot it can possibly get. The only place you won't be able to lay eyes on it. Directly behind you. And at that point, 
it's too late for you. The second thing I told him was that I'll be back in two days and more than likely he'll be dead. And then that's when I left. Two days later, I pulled my van up to Tim's driveway to find the screen door open and blowing in the wind. I didn't even need to cross the threshold of his house to find him. He was everywhere, on the floor, the ceiling, the walls. The smell was unbelievable. I poured some gas on the front porch and then I used a match to light it. The house was an inferno within 30 seconds. I got in my van and started to pull out of the driveway and I took one last look at the house and then beyond, out in the tree line where I saw, for just a split second, a young boy, before he quickly pulled back and disappeared behind a thin, little tree. I was hundreds of miles away by lunchtime. I say all of this to you if you ever think you might have a hide behind in your house or even in the area, leave. Burn the place down if you can, so nobody can move into it. These things are like bears. If they know they can get food someplace, they are just going to keep coming back. And if you get the feeling that you're being watched and you can't figure out why, call your loved ones because it's standing directly behind you. The year was 2004 in South California. I was 16 years old, Native American, Navajo. My grandmother was a medicine woman at such a young age. She was in the process of teaching me her ways. When I was a child, she always told me not to be afraid of anything I might see and that I was special. Ever since then, it was like a gate opened in me and I began to see things and feel them sometimes, cries and screams like whispers in my ears. This causes me to have to wear earbuds to sleep, playing some music in order to drown out everything and just sleep. I've been through a lot of hauntings as I was a kid, until this day in 2021, but this haunting was one that has upset me, as something attacked my mother. One day, my mother came to me and I could see she looked so drained, like she hadn't gotten good sleep in a long time. I asked her what was wrong, when I noticed that she didn't seem scared. She said to me, I'm terrified to sleep. Every night, I awake, and I can't move at all. And then all of a sudden, I see something dark, slowly crawling from the edge of the bed by my feet, climbing up my legs all the way to me. All I can do was cry. I feel hands on my neck starting to choke me. I try to move to wake up your dad, but nothing happens. I kept my eyes on her, listening to her story to hear every word. I am no stranger to the supernatural, and I know ways to keep things away. This angered me that something in my family's home was hurting my mother. I try to calm her down and assure her she would be okay. Mom, come sleep in my room tonight. I'll stay up and watch you as you sleep, and I'll see if I can catch it. I have a little dog named Princess. She was a very good dog. She would sleep with me in my room, and she would always growl when she felt danger, tangible or supernatural. Through the night, she would keep watching me all the time, and she made me feel safe. That night, my mother came into my room lay down the bed and I told her to sleep reminding her that I would be here so that she doesn't have to worry about anything. It was around 10 p.m. and she finally fell fast asleep. I stayed up right next to her with my dog in the middle of us. The dog soon fell asleep too and at around 2 a.m. nothing had yet happened. So I got up to use the bathroom. As I was coming out of the bathroom I looked at my bedroom door 
which I kept open just in case. And that's when a dark shape ran past inside. In my head, I thought, well, here we go. I walked back into my room and closed the door behind me. I laid on the bed and waited for anything to happen. Before long, I was getting bored since nothing was happening. I lay on my stomach with my hand holding my head. I let out a long breath. I folded my hands and I lay my head on them, facing away from the door. Not even one second passed and I heard my door open. I had a quick conversation in my head and it was something like this. Did something wake you up? Maybe my little brother. He must have woken up. As I was saying this in my head, I felt like someone was shaking the bed, but only by our heads. They were shaking it in a way as if they were testing to see if a person was awake. I said again in my head, it must be my little brother. I better get up to see if he's okay. But when I tried to move, I couldn't at all. My head, my hands. I was completely frozen. The moment I noticed I couldn't move, I began to feel something climbing on the bed and on top of my mother. My heart began to pound and I was thinking of what I could do. I felt something like a leg on the side of me from this thing that was on my mom. The bed felt like it was sinking in the middle and whatever this was had its foot on my dog. My dog didn't even bother moving. It didn't make a noise this whole time. I thought in my head saying I had to do something. I need to think. At that moment, my side began to feel like it was on fire. It hurt so bad, making me lose focus on trying to think. But I pushed through. I ended up facing my fears and panics and also became committed to prayer. But I couldn't believe it. I couldn't remember any prayers at the moment. I couldn't even make one up. I was blocked. So I looked at my hand that was close to my face and I tried to focus on it saying in my head open your hands just open it i tried and tried but nothing was happening i kept saying it over and over it felt like hours now but i needed to fight this and save my mom from this evil spirit but then i felt the top of my fingers i took that and began to try and open my hand fully and slowly i could feel it moving as i felt my hand open just a bit this thing jumped off my bed and ran out of the room. I heard my bedroom door slam shut and I could finally fully move again. I looked at my mom and she was okay with it. I let out a sigh of relief and tears just started flowing again. My mom woke up asking what happened and why I was crying like that. So I told her, let's get the fuck out of here. So she and I went to the living room and I told her everything that happened. After that, she looked so scared as I finished the story. We heard something that sounded like something running on hard wood. We looked up and it was coming from the attic. But this time, it sounded like it was trying to get away. And then, it was gone. We didn't know what it was that was haunting my mom. But after that night, it never came back. And my mom thanked me for helping her. Amen. First of all, I like to apologize for any grammatical errors. I also don't spend much time on here, so I have no clue if this is the right place to post this in. But I know you guys know your shit, so I assume it's the best place to ask. Second, I only just recently learned what a skinwalker is, and I still don't know much about them, which is why I would like other people's opinions. This happened in September of last year. We live on a huge horse farm in southern Kentucky. My mom, the horse fanatic in the family, travels all over the country taking out horses to shows and competitions. During that time, I get stuck at home with the responsibility of feeding the animals and other non-show horses. My parents were at a weekend long show. It was around 5.30 p.m. and I was on my way down to the barn to give the horses their evening meal. Our horses are arranged in multiple sections, pregnant ones, show horses in another, etc. 
I was almost done feeding and only had the southwest corner section to go. When I looked into the field that lined that section and saw something that I really can't explain with words. It was far enough away that I couldn't make out facial features, but I could tell it wasn't human. It was standing upright on two legs that seemed to be on backwards. Instead of the knees bending the right way, they went the opposite way. The closest thing I can describe it would be like a very thin, hairless horse standing up. I didn't notice any arms, but with how far away it is, I'm assuming they could have just been close to the body that I didn't see them. It scared the hell out of me, but I don't think it saw me. It looked like it was watching my house, which was about a hundred yards to the northwest of there. I kind of just stood there. I didn't really know what to do, so I just kind of slowly started backing up until I was back in the barn. There's a small part in the barn where there are a couple of missing boards that you can easily see out of. So I stood there watching it for a while. I didn't want to go back home because I was scared it would see me. So I just waited. I waited for what felt like forever before this thing kind of turned around and walked away into the woods. But the way it walked was the scariest thing about it. It was so unnatural. I waited a little bit, then ran back to the house as quickly as I could. The next morning, my parents got home, so I didn't have to feed the horses again after that. I have never told anyone about this, but after discovering skinwalkers, I'm wondering what you guys think. If it's not a skinwalker, what else could it be? I had a childhood friend, Johnny. We weren't the closest, but we were part of the same quote unquote church. So sometimes we spent time at each other's houses. He lived outside of town at a large house that sat near the woods. This wasn't at all strange to me as many of my friends at the time, if not most, lived in similar circumstances. So it naturally became standard to play outside, hiking around the property the woods, the large field in front of the house, everywhere. Johnny had a little brother, Stephen, who sometimes wanted to tag along as well. Frankly, I don't remember much about how we would play, pretend, mostly I assume. This was the early 90s. None of us were from well-off families, and imagination was dirt cheap. You know, sometimes I really wish I could write off what I saw as imagination. It would be easier. This happened during one summer. All those years ago, Johnny, Steven, and I were doing our usual walking around, talking, playing pretend, down at the bottom of one of the large fields that surrounded the house. I can remember how hot it was. The grasses around us had long since dried. There was a sour smell in the air from all the weeds and shrubs surrounding us. The only things that remained green were the abundant brambles of blackberries that grew in huge, towering clusters off to one side of the property. I can remember there was this little rotting shack made of boards down there, and that's where we were, playing right near it. I had wandered just a bit away from them. It couldn't have been more than 10 feet. That's when I glanced away and saw it. There was something in the blackberry bushes. I couldn't tell what it was, but... I reacted as best as my childhood mind would allow me to and ducked behind a nearby shrub out of fear. Now keep in mind, these blackberry bushes in front of me weren't small. Such clusters can often climb small trees and grow into a sort of wall of thorny bushes. These were anywhere from 8 to 10 feet high and whatever this thing was, it towered over them by at least a couple of feet. I could see its whole upper torso, arms, and head. It had thick black fur. It was clearly standing on two legs, and at that second, it looked like it was reaching for something. Now I'm sure at this second, you might be thinking, so this person saw a bear eating berries as a kid, really scary. 
But this thing wasn't a bear. I was raised near the woods. I was young, but I had seen plenty of animals, and this thing was not a bear. Its shoulders, arms, and face looked very humanoid, but it was distorted, somehow evil looking. Frankly, the thought my young mind had at the time was demon. The thing that was most striking though were its eyes. They were red, which I'm sure it sounds cartoonish, but to a child, it might as well have been that the reaper was right in front of me, and it did have that vibe. This thing was terrifying, and something inside me told me that if I didn't run right there and then, that I might not make it. I bolted for the house, screaming for Johnny and Steven to run with me. They did, acting either on instinct, at the sound of my voice, or just playing along with the moment. At least I suspect Johnny was. Playing along, that is. Steven, being younger, seemed to pick up on my fear. The wind was so intensely whipping by my ears that I couldn't really hear if the creature was in pursuit, but I dared not look back. Finally, we reached the safety of the house's deck and quickly ran inside. I tried to explain what happened to Johnny's parents, all about this demon that I saw in the blackberry bushes. Of course, they treated me like a dumb kid. My parents seemed to entertain that I saw something, but not that it was supernatural. I spent my life casually trying to understand what happened. Every couple of years, the memory resurfaces, like a nightmare that never quite leaves you. We did like to play pretend, after all. And it was very hot that day, not to mention, clearly berries would explain the presence of a bear. But again, I knew the shape of a bear. I dabble in a little missing 411 info over the years, and there have been reports of certain things, creatures, that match. I forget the name, and I just tried looking it up, but couldn't find it. But apparently, there's something called a skinwalker, and is said to have red eyes. Apparently, the legend goes that they like to twist people's heads off and wear their skin. As for what I actually saw, I suppose I'll never know. But I'll say this much. I hope I never see it again. I live right next to a res. I go there sometimes to get gas, since they have the cheapest price. I mostly go at night, and on this one specific night, I was hanging out filling up the 26 gallon tank in my truck. It had just hit the orange light, and I was sitting out there and all the light I had was the gas station. As I was standing out there, I kept hearing dogs, and the noise from the res, but it was just the border of darkness. And to be honest, I just wanted to get out of there, and for the next 10 minutes, I was just sitting there, scared shitless that I was going to be a victim. I rushed to put the host right in there and sped off just thinking about all the things I heard. And now, I have learned that the gas station that I go to, it's actually pretty close to the cemetery around that area. And from now on, I'm gonna go during the day. It's my first time telling my story here. Some background information. I was 16, I was working at McDonald's, and I would work every weekend and help open at 5 in the morning. I was on my way to work and it was around 4.55. I remember that on my way to work, some of the stores would have their lights on by this time, and everything looked dark around the road. And I always remember thinking, there's no cars around, everything looks dark. Which was actually strange that our location was near a highway and we would always have truckers or early birds come in for a morning's breakfast. I clocked in and it was just me and my manager and a maintenance guy there. We were in charge of getting everything ready for the morning shift. I remember I was stocking some things up in the front. Then my manager said, Hey Carlos, I'll be right back, I'm going to the bathroom. I then said okay 
Most of the time when this happened, I was in charge of taking orders and giving them out and everything, which wasn't much because we would have like one car every five minutes. So once I was done, I realized that my manager was still in the bathroom, obviously on her phone. So I walked out to the lobby to go see if we had any more cars left. So I turned around to see the opposite way, to look outside to the parking lot. And there it was, a black creature-like that looked like a man. It was tall, around six feet tall. I remember trying to get a better look at it so I got close to the window to see and I realized it was just completely black, no form of light passing through it. As I got closer, I got the feeling of more pressure on my chest. That's when I heard my manager coming out the bathroom. As I saw her come out, I quickly looked back and this thing had disappeared. This really freaked me out and I never experienced something like that before. I honestly don't know what it was, but according to Google, it could have been some kind of cryptid. This is my true skinwalker story. At the time of this experience, I had no knowledge, nor had I ever heard about a skinwalker. I was 19 years old and I lived in Phoenix, Arizona with my parents while attending community college. My sister-in-law had asked me to go with her to Tuba City, Arizona, to visit with her mother and pick up some papers. Her mother was a school teacher there on the Navajo Res. We would be staying there overnight. Her mother lived in one of those small government houses on the Res. There were about three or four houses near her on a small paved street, except for a few buildings near there. It was pretty isolated. My niece and nephew were with us and we'll call my sister-in-law Mary, my nephew Mike, and my niece Amy. Mike was only 10 years old, and Amy was 9. It was early evening when we arrived in Tuba City. We had stopped at a fast food restaurant on the way to pick up dinner to go. After arriving at the house, we all laid together at a small kitchen table. We talked and visited a while before going into the small living room to watch TV. There wasn't a lot to do there, so Mary and I decided we would take a night drive and explore around the res. I know what you're thinking. It's a very bad idea. Or a stupid idea. We drove around for about an hour and a half. Surprisingly, nothing weird happened. We were just laughing, talking, and listening to music as we drove up and down the dirt roads. After a while, we decided to head back. When arriving back home, we stayed up a little bit later, and then we decided it was time to go to bed. I slept in a small back bedroom on a twin bed next to a window with blinds. My nephew Mike slept on the floor in a sleeping bag in the same room. Mary and Amy were in the other room down the hallway. During the night, I was awakened by some strange, scratchy noises outside the window by my bed. It sounded like something was making long, slow clawing sounds down the window. Like when someone runs their nails down a chalkboard. I am a light sleeper, so this of course woke me up. I whisper out loud to my nephew Mike to wake up, asking him if he was hearing the same thing I was. Mike was sleepy and groggy, being awakened from a deep slumber, so he seemed confused at first. I asked him again if he had heard the scratching noise but he didn't answer. He was just out of it. He then laid back down and was out like a light. I was perplexed and a little scared. I thought to myself maybe it was just a stray cat or dog, but I couldn't figure it out. I did, however, have no indication to look out that window, so I just lay there listening. After a few minutes, the clawing stopped. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew it was morning. I mentioned this at the kitchen table during breakfast, but no one seemed very interested. We left later that afternoon, and I never even thought about it again. Six months later, I was attending one of my college courses. 
the teacher was lecturing us about different legends and stories of the Navajo people. He touched on the stories of evil medicine men, or witches, that are called skinwalkers. He began telling us that they are very dangerous and harmful. They have the ability to turn into or disguise themselves as any animal. They could take the form of a coyote, wolf, or even a bear. They also been known to follow people home at night. That's why you should never be out on the res after dark. You're never supposed to make eye contact with the skinwalker because they can actually possess your soul. You should never talk about them because you can draw them to you. They can cause issues and bring evil into your life. An icy chill went down my spine. I remember that night I had spent on the res. I wonder if a skinwalker had followed Mary and me home that night after our drive. The realization that a skinwalker had targeted us fills me with fear. I think of this often, and I'm so glad I didn't look out the window that night. I'm also haunted by the fact that there was just a very thin pane of glass separating me from such an evil thing. And now, I guess I know why no one in the family wanted to talk about it. I never told this story to anyone, and I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today, and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there, and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out, along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced-in area was only a small part of the property but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I really get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced-in area, and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in, to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark, no city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room, and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night, or... Once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden 
and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree. But the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it. The dog also creeped me out. But you know, angry dog. And I was a kid. It happened. Now, I do get scared pretty fast. I always been that way. For example, I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing. Just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before, because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest, for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway. Right outside the door. Facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing. And he just stood there. Blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room. But I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there, without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear. But he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out. But it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him, but when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer. And that's when he followed me, like, right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. 
Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. And Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. So after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him, because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settle down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence. So the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's gonna wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone but there's absolutely no way I'm gonna go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly, her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer. Because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall, in my mother's low voice, the same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually, 
the scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away. But that one night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night, unless I'm with a bunch of people, and I will never, ever live in the woods again. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed hearing about this, as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening. When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place, only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs, and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head, and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder, or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag labeled with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29th stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked them to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands tried to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night, but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag, and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished, it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields, and one at a time, I guided each cow to its assigned stall. 
I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others, was a cow, alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange, though, was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I wasn't eager to tell my boss. They had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last as I continue to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field and surely enough she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came upon her, I could hear a definite but muffled chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear, searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it, but still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again. But this time, it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself. Wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak. A slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the 8 foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. 
Its pupils seem to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body. Its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh. 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 The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figure it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. I heard of skinwalkers before, but I always assumed they were the Native American version of werewolves, so I never gave them much thought, until last week when one of my co-workers in my new job told me that they were his most feared folklore creatures. He's originally from Utah, so that makes sense. He suggested some YouTube videos to watch on the subject and after work that night I watched about four or five of the videos. Now I totally understand his stance on them now. I live in South Carolina so to be completely honest I wasn't too worried about the possibility of running into one. My co-worker told me that they were basically a midwestern thing. I would be more worried about Wendigos if I were you. He joked the day after I watched the videos. We had a good chat about skinwalkers and Wendigos turning our shift and just revel in the creepiness of them. I mentioned how one of the tales said that the more you talk about skinwalkers, the more they're drawn to you. And he made sarcastic ghost noises to keep the mood light. The night I showed the videos to my fiance, she was way more creeped out than I was. I became kind of obsessed. I love scary things and couldn't help but watch every video I came across. I talked about skinwalkers with my other friends who love horror, looked up skinwalker art, read true skinwalker stories on reddit, just drove head first into all things about skinwalkers. This went on for a few days until I started feeling a little burned out on the subject. I live in a fairly nice neighborhood 
where all the houses are on one side of the street. On the other side is land that used to belong to the local elementary school. The building is on the next street over. So basically, it was like the school's backyard or whatever. However, the school shut down about 30 or 40 years ago and the county just let nature reclaim it. So directly across from my house is an old chain link fence and just overgrown woods. Two nights ago, I was smoking a cigarette and I heard some leaves rustling across the street. I didn't bother looking up from my phone. I live across from the woods, so it must have been a deer. The rustling stopped, then it started again, and it sounded like whatever was over there was running back and forth along the fence line, panting like a dog. This, however, caught my attention. There had been a few cases of rabies in my town because of a strange dog that was running around in the middle of the night and it was definitely something I wanted to keep my eye on. I look up from my phone in the direction of the sounds and they just stopped. It was like the thing knew I noticed it. I strained my eyes trying to see what it was, but it was obscured by the overgrowth. I didn't look away, must have stared at the spot for at least a minute. It didn't make another sound, didn't move, so I knew it was still there. A chill ran down my spine, and I began thinking of every Skinwalker video I had watched over the last week, and I felt sick to my stomach. I quickly put out my cigarette and went inside. The next morning, I took my dog out for a short walk. She's a pug zoo named Honey and is like my child. Me and my fiance taught her that pee pee poo poo means it's time to go outside to potty. It's the cutest thing. Anyway, this particular morning, I take her out to the front yard to do her business. She pees and then walks around sniffling for about five minutes before walking to the side of the street and sitting down. She's never done this before, so I was a little annoyed. I tugged on her leash lightly and tried to bring her back towards the house. Come on, honey, got a poo-poo. She didn't budge. This dog could be stubborn sometimes, but this was something else. She tugged back against the leash and just stared across the street, sniffing the air occasionally. It was then at that moment that I realized she was staring at the exact spot that I had heard the thing the night before. I got goosebumps and I quickly picked her up and began walking back to the house. As I got closer, I noticed something on the ground by my front steps. It was one of the Halloween decorations my fiance had put up on our house. Plastic black roses with plastic eyeballs and spiders on them. The stems were wire so they can be wrapped around things to keep them secure. This flower was torn apart. Something had come into my porch, taken down the flower and torn it apart, leaving it in the front of my steps. I picked up the flower and threw it away. I didn't tell my fiance. I didn't want her freaking out. The rest of the day went by uneventfully. That night, I told my coworker about what happened and he looked a little concerned, but brushed it off. He said what I heard was most likely just a dog and the flower was most likely knocked down by the wind. I had my doubts. As I was walking to my door after getting home from work last night, I heard some panting as the night before and the clicking of claws against asphalt. I turned quickly to see a dog that looked like a brown mangy bull terrier hauling ass down my street. The street is about 40 feet away from my front porch so I couldn't get a great look at it, but I could tell it was only running on three legs because one looked mangled. 
It turned quickly and darted into the tree line across the street through a part of the fence that had been pulled back. The fence wasn't like that earlier in the day, and that's when I noticed that the dog didn't have a tail. I almost threw up. Skinwalker legend says that when they take the form of an animal, they never have tails. I tried to rationalize it to myself. Maybe it just had a stub tail that I missed because it was running. However, I immediately went inside. My fiance was sitting on the couch petting honey. She could see I was upset and asked me what was wrong. I told her nothing, just almost got clipped by a car before I pulled into the driveway. She got up, hugged me, and cursed the person that almost hit me. She then asked me if I could take honey out for pee pee poo poo because she had been creeped out by all the spooky videos we've been watching and didn't feel comfortable going outside at night by herself. Honey perked up. She ran to the door and looked between me and the door all excited. I stared down at her for a moment before agreeing to it. I'll just keep her close to the porch, I thought. We walked off the porch and she quickly tried to walk to the street. I tugged on the leash and she tugged back. She eventually moved to the edge of the porch and peed. After she began walking around sniffing, I told her the usual line. Come on honey, got a poo poo. She huffed at me, sniffed around some more, and eventually started pooping. I was on the edge the entire time we were outside, but being around her helped me calm down just a little. Then I heard it from across the street. Come on, honey. My voice and the exact same tone and inflection as I had just said it, it sounded staticky like an old radio broadcast, but it was definitely my voice. Honey then stopped what she was doing and stood alert. She looked over to me and cocked her head. Come on, honey, got a poo poo. Again, my voice called from across the street. Honey began whining, looking from me to the woods across the street. I picked her up and I began backing up to the steps, now taking my eyes off the part of the fence that had been pulled back. Honey, come. The voice sounded firm now, like it was getting aggravated. Honey squirmed in my arms, whining. I didn't know if she was trying to get out to go to the voice or to run inside, but I wasn't taking any chances. I turned and bolted up the steps and to the door. As I walked inside, I turned one last time to look across the street. There, standing in the part of the fence that was pulled back, was the dog. Its eyes were glowing a dull orange, and it had its teeth barred. The face was all wrong, like someone had taken a distortion tool and just dragged around random features. Once again, I didn't tell my fiance. Stupid horror movie cliche shit, I know, but I really didn't want her losing her shit. I just told her there's a strange dog running around the neighborhood so to not take honey out at night. Later that night, after we had gone to bed, I woke up to the sound of footsteps pacing back and forth outside my window. Against my better judgment, I rode over to try to see it. And then, the pacing stops. Come on, honey. My voice called out, cutting through the quiet of the night. I prayed my fiance didn't hear it. It called out two more times before I heard it walking away. I didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Today, when I get to work, I'm going to ask my co-worker what I can do to get rid of this thing. Um, scare. I don't think there's a way. But if anyone knows anything, please let me know. Come on, honey.
before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my gammy and gampy at the end of my school years. I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone, down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong. Even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me. Sugar Booger, that being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what 
I had heard, but it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Trigger burger. I looked up where I heard it coming from, which was from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later, it was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night, since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side, trying to fall back asleep until I heard my eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken, but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep, and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then, I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then, I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, that if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again, but this time it was my actual name, Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. 
She looked up into the bushes where we heard it, then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes, the same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pan, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. 
In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened, and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head, and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time, I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now, they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was, too scared to even blink. Then, I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw and then They started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault, and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, 
If there's anyone out there who does know, please help me.